Let's open our Bibles, please, to the Song of Solomon. And we're going to be in chapter 4, Song of Solomon, chapter 4. As you're locating the Song of Solomon, just want to uh, recognize our visitors that have come here today to encourage and support Peter. We just want to welcome you here. Thank you for coming. We're, we're, gr- we're grateful that you're here with us. And now we can open the Bible and we can consider God's precious word together. We're in the Song of Solomon, chapter 4. And just as an aid to the memory, you remember that the Song of Solomon is a celebration of the love relationship that exists between a man and a woman, which God says is integral to a very good world. At the dawn of human history, the dawn of earth history, God said everything he made was good, but he didn't pronounce the created order very good until he had created the first man and the first woman and brought them together in a marriage covenant relationship. So, of course, when we think about these things, we're thinking about Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, and his church that he purchased and redeemed with his own blood. We're called his bride, his body and bride. Of course, we think about these things. And so when we come to the Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and verse 6, we're listening to the man now. This is the man talking. And it's Solomon, but he says things that remind us of Jesus. And that's what we're looking for, reminders of Jesus. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 6. Solomon says, Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Now just stop there. This is obviously poetry, and the mountain and the hill are synonyms, but he's talking about a mountain or a hill of myrrh and incense, frankincense. Myrrh is a fragrant gum, resin taken from certain trees, used in medicines and perfumes. That's myrrh. And frankincense, of course, that's another kind of tree resin used in incense. When they burn incense, the smoke goes up. Solomon here is probably referring to Mount Moriah, where the temple was built. You remember that's, that was the, absolutely central to the religious system at that time. And in 2 Chronicles 3.1, we learned the temple was built on that mountain, the very mountain where Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac. And, of course, God spared him and provided a ram. But God said, I will provide a lamb. So when Jesus arrived on the scene, people were expecting the lamb. And John the Baptist looked at Jesus, John 1.29. He said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There he is. After 2,000 years, he's arrived. But the uh, myrrh that Solomon is talking about here, the myrrh is used in the priest's anointing oil. You read about that in the Law of Moses. And the frankincense was burned on the altar of incense just outside the most holy place in the temple. Now, when we think about these realities, our minds immediately go to Jesus and Mount Calvary. I know my mind does. Because think about it. The burning of the frankincense at the altar of incense is a symbol of intercessory prayer. That's why the psalmist wrote in Psalm 141 and verse 2, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, my prayer as incense, and the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now think about that. In the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, chapter 5 and verse 8, you see the scene in heaven... And you see bowls full of incense, and John says the incense is the prayers of the saints. Well, I want to say that Jesus Christ was sacrificed on Mount Calvary, and he spread out his hands literally, and they were lifted up literally, and he made intercessory prayer. He prayed for the people who were killing him. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That is a kind of love we know hardly anything about. A man may perhaps die for a good person, but who wants to die for a wicked person, especially a wicked person who's in the middle of murdering you? But this is divine love, and this is divine blood being shed here, and Jesus is a different kind of person. And he made intercession for the transgressors. Father, forgive them. And the mention of myrrh here, this uh, mountain of myrrh, Uh, Of course, myrrh is used in the embalming process. In John 19 and verse 39, you read that they embalmed Jesus' body with myrrh and aloes. And in John 19 and verse 41, you read that the cross and the tomb were in very close proximity to each other. They're not very far at all. They're in the same location, really. 
And our psalmist here, or excuse me, our uh, writer of the Song of Solomon, he says, I'm going this, to this place until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. And I see reference here to the resurrection of Jesus. All four Gospels record that it was early on the first day of the week when Jesus was raised bodily from the dead. At daybreak, the tomb was found empty. Until the day breaks, Jesus says, I'm going there, the mountain of myrrh, the hill of frankincense, Calvary. I'm there until the third day, until the day breaks. It's amazing. If your eyes are opened, everything you see in the Bible reminds you of Jesus. Now look at the result of what he's done. Verse 7, the man says, You are fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon, look from the top of Amana, from the top of Sinir and Hermon, from the lion's dens and from the mountains of the leopards. What Jesus has done for us is unspeakably great. We came into the world totally depraved. There was not one part of us, body, soul, and spirit, that was untouched with sin. Complete, total disasters, double disasters. But Jesus Christ has done what was necessary to purge us of all sin and unrighteousness. And just as this man here we take to be Solomon looks at this woman and he sees absolute perfection, God looks at us and sees absolute perfection because we are in Christ. The Bible makes a special note of that. If you believe in Jesus, you are in Christ. You are in Christ and you're declared to be holy and innocent and beloved and accepted and complete because of the redemptive work of Jesus and the following regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and his sanctifying work in this life. And, you know, this all comes together in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, where Paul says that... uh, The Lord Jesus has purchased to himself a church, a body and bride, and he sanctifies that church with the washing of water by the word so that he will have a church to present to himself that is cleansed and sanctified and holy and without spot and without blemish or any such thing. That's how that works. And I see actually in this little passage that we just read a sort of rapture principle too because he says there at the end of verse 7, He's going to take this lady away, calling her to the heights of four mountain ranges in northern Israel, above all the dangers, above the lions and the leopards. You know what the Bible says? That one day you and I, the church of Jesus Christ, we're going to be called off this, off this planet, off this world, and we'll be taken into the sky, and then we'll be taken into heaven itself. We'll be far above all satanically energized government systems typified in the Bible as ravening beasts like leopards and lions and things like that. But look at verse 9 now, please. 4 and 9. He says in verse uh, 9, You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace, How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse. How much better than wine is your love and the scent of your perfumes than all spices. He says uh, his spouse is his sister. How does that work? (laughs) Well, I think what he's saying here is that they have the same father, and that's God. And that's a very, very important point in the Bible. The Bible says in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, That as a believer, you're free to marry whoever you want. Only in the Lord, Paul says. Only in the Lord. Believers with believers only. Because you're asking for trouble otherwise. If you're a believer in Jesus, and you're walking with the Lord, and he is the ultimate object of your faith and allegiance and obedience and affection, how can you marry a non-believer who doesn't have that same ultimate reference point? It's going to create lots of problems. And I understand sometimes people get married, and one of them converts. Now you've got a little problem there, but the, the New Testament prescribes how to handle that too. God wants us to succeed and not fail. He tells you how to handle this. It's all, in, it's all there in the Bible. But believers with believers only, so that a husband and a wife, they have the same father, and that's God. They've been adopted into the same family. And this is a little segue into discussing Jesus, I think. Jesus Christ is called the only begotten Son of God. The only begotten Son. In Greek, it's monogenes. Mono, only. Genes, a kind, a genus. 
Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. That means he is God's Son uniquely. There's no one you can call God's Son and mean what you mean when you say Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one and only, the monogenes, the only begotten. We are children of God. The Bible calls us sons of God. But we are sons of God through the exercise of our faith. God sort of incorporates us into his family. But Jesus Christ is the Son of God by virtue of the fact that he has the same nature as his Father. He shares the exact same divine nature and substance as his Father, absolutely uncreated and fully divine. And that's not us. But we're called into this relationship. This is why Jesus said in John 20 and verse 17, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. He didn't say our Father. My Father and your Father. And to my God and your God. He didn't say our God. Because Jesus has a very unique special and mysterious relationship to his father. So there are some similarities to the way Jesus relates to his father, to the way we relate to his father. There are some similarities, but there are differences too that we always must keep, keep in mind. The point we want to make here is that our Lord Jesus has done what was necessary to qualify us to be his bride. And that's amazing. And no one in human history could have ever forecasted what God would do to fix our sin problem. But God has done it. Surprisingly, he's done it. And I like how this man here we take to be Solomon, he celebrates this woman who's become the object of his special attention and affection. And he says that um, her love is better than wine, better than the scent of perfumes and all spices. What he's saying there is that her love to him is better than all worldly goods. Her love, her attention directed at him, he would pay anything for it. And um, I'm going to share a little personal story here. That's okay. Here comes a personal story. So, okay. When I was like 14 or 15 years old, I went to the theater. I saw the dumbest movie ever made, I'm sure. <laughs> it was the DC Comics adaptation of Supergirl. You ever see that movie? If you haven't, don't bother. <laughs> but at 15 years old, I absolutely fell in love with the lead character. Supergirl, 1984. Don't go to your phones and look just yet. <laughs> you can do that after. Beautiful blonde lady. Oh, I used to be an artist. I used to sketch a lot. My sketch pads were filled with her image. I was drawing her. My room filled with pictures of Helen Slater. Her name is Helen Slater. And what I would have given to have met that lady in person. Oh, do you remember crushing on someone that didn't know you existed? Just <laughs> crushing on this person. I would give anything to meet Helen Slater. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, of course, I dodged a bullet there because I met Lindy. Kind of looks like her, too. <laughs> Beautiful blonde woman. <laughs> what you wouldn't have given to have that person express interest in you. I remember crushing on this lady. I mean, just unbelievable. For some reason, saints, that I don't understand, God values us and our love. We know that he does because he redeemed us and purchased us to himself at a very high price. And the Bible says that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you are not your own. You were, you were bought at a price. So honor God with your body and with your spirit, which are God's now. In Acts 20 and verse 28, we are told that you and I were washed clean of our sins by divine blood. That was the Son of God who hung on a cross for six hours and his blood was shed to cleanse you and I of all sin and unrighteousness. And that's mysterious, but this is what the Bible says. So the greatest command now to all of us is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves because our God has declared himself to be maximally lovely first. He loved us first. That's why the Apostle John says we love him because. There's a reason why we love him. Because he loved us first. We love him in return. And that's amazing. And these are things that we should contemplate and think about, meditate on. As we move ahead in the Song of Solomon, we follow the beloved and his, his bride, the Shulamite. We follow these two and in chapter 5, she has another dream. Remember, she had a dream earlier on. You dream about things you worry about, hey? 
and she dreams she's lost him again, and she's asking everybody, have you seen my beloved? Where is he? Where's my beloved? I'm desperate. I need to find him. And someone asks her, well, what's so special about this guy? And she says, he's altogether lovely. My beloved is my friend. That's beautiful. Jesus told his apostles, I don't call you servants, I call you friends. A servant doesn't know what his master's up to, but I'm telling you everything. And God considers us to be his friend. He's given us the Bible, 66 books, an infallible, sacred library disclosing God's heart on the matter and what he plans to do with you, what he plans to do with planet Earth in the future. He's telling us all about it because we're his friends. We're not just servants. We are servants. He is the king. We are subjects. But it's more than that. It's so much more than that. We are Christ's body and bride. And he tells us the truth. He informs us. And we're his friends. And he's the best friend you'll ever have, really. And to the marrieds out out there listening, I want to say, do life with your spouse. Do life together. Solve problems together. Do something meaningful together. Do life together. Walk together. You can have your individual interests and hobbies, sure, of course, but for the most part, typically, normally, naturally, you should be walking through life together, not segregated, discreet individuals who barely contact each other. No, absolutely not. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus is doing life with us. He's showing us the way. Make your spouse your best friend in the world. That's, that's, I can honestly tell you, that's my experience. My best friend in all the world under the sun, next to Jesus, is my wife. We do life together. We do everything together. By the way, I'm taking next Thursday off. We're doing that day together. (laughs) I should have mentioned that earlier. (laughs) But in chapter 6 now, in chapter 6, this lady, she marvels at her own personal history. Remember, she started off kind of a servant girl, working out there in, in, the, in the field, and the sun is scorching her and damaging her, and she really doesn't look very special. And um, something amazing has happened to her. Look at chapter 6 and verse 11, please. Just go to 611. 611. I went down to the garden of nuts. There's a joke there somewhere. <laughs> I'll leave that. <laughs> I went down to the Garden of Nuts to see the virtue of the valley. That's the greenness of growing vegetation, by the way. To see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed. Before I was even aware, my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. She's saying, in other words, uh, in the past she had engaged in these sort of mundane, rustic tasks and affairs, They were assigned to her, you remember, by her somewhat uncaring and a bit cruel brothers, sent her out to work, labor. But suddenly she she saw that she was discovered by the king. The king had taken notice of her. That was shocking. And he brought her into his house, we read about that, and she was transformed instantly into an exalted person. Suddenly she's nobility. Suddenly she's importance, very significant in the kingdom. Solomon's banner over her was love public display of his love and affection for this lady. And he's the king, and no one's going to argue with the king. And I think it's a bit like God disclosing his love for us in front of the angels. And the angels are not going to argue with God, but they wonder about these things. This is us, friends. We started off disastrous, children of wrath, according to our natures. And God had pity on us, the king of kings, And he's made us now kings and priests to his God, the Bible says. And we will reign on the earth. We'll even judge angels, the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you and I will judge angels in God's coming new administrations. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2 says that God has not put the world to come in subjection to angels. He's put all things under the feet of Jesus, and we are in Christ. And that's amazing, and that's beautiful to think about. Just move ahead, please, into chapter 8 now, chapter 8 and verse 6. And we're going to end with this little passage here, chapter 8 and verse 6. This is the lady now, the Shulamite. She's singing to her husband. And there are beautiful things to think about. Chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart. Remember me, in other words. 
as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death and jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement fire. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Let's think about these beautiful words. She says, set me as a seal upon your heart. Remember me. Keep me in your heart. Don't you see in those words a little reminder of that dying Jew next to Jesus who looked over at the Lord and said, remember me, Lord Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, just for that, today you'll be with me in paradise. Amazing. Just call upon the name of the Lord in true faith and repentance, and you'll be saved, the Bible says. And then uh, she says, set me as a seal on your arm. Your outward conduct, may it be kind towards me. You know, remember me, think about me. Take care of my needs. May your outward conduct towards me be kind. My prayer for myself and for others that I love is something like this. I'll often pray like this. I'll say, Lord, God, have mercy on me. (laughs) Make the changes in me that need to be made, but please go easy on me, Lord. Don't absolutely crush me. I know there are a lot of changes need to happen yet. I've not reached perfection. Paul said I've, I've not yet arrived. None of us have. We say, God, some changes need to happen But please, Lord, go easy on me. You ever pray like that? I do. The Shulamite says, love is as strong as death. I'd like to say that love is stronger than death. Jesus Christ is love incarnate. The Bible says twice that God is love and death couldn't hold him. No way. The pangs of death could not hold him. The earth was like a womb, says the patriarch Job. And you know what happens when a lady's in labor? That baby's coming, like it or not. And the earth was a womb that could not contain Jesus. Like it or not, he's back. And death will never claim him again. Love incarnate is back and glorified. And she says here that love's flames are flames of fire, a most vehement fire. Literally, it, it talks about the flames of Yah which is the shortened version of the covenant name of God Almighty. Love is a flame that was kindled by God himself. And all opposing, competing agencies in the world by men or devil or demons, whatever, they're all typified as water that cannot quench true love. Can't be done. Because God himself lit that flame. And I want to say that love we recognize to be the greatest of ethics and the noblest of the virtues. And we know that, friends, faith among men can move mountains, but love moved God to accomplish the impossible, the redemption of fallen sinners to himself. And that's the gospel. That's the mystery, the wonder of the gospel, that the God who disclosed himself as love became love incarnate, and did what was necessary and needful to redeem us to himself, totally unworthy sinners. He stepped into the world and did the impossible and made us acceptable in his sight. And now we are the objects of his special redemptive love, and Jesus says nothing can snatch you out of his hand. If he loved you while you were a sinner and tasted death for you, how do you think he feels about you now that you're a saved, sealed, born-again believer? If God did not spare his only son but delivered him up for us all, how will he not with him also give you all things freely? That's what the Bible says. Let's have a prayer, and we'll just finish right there. (coughs) Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Christ Jesus our Lord, we just love you. We honor you today. We remember, Lord, what you did for us to secure our redemption And to see to it that we were not just declared innocent, but we were actually now declared righteous, complete in Jesus. Thank you for Christ the Lord and his redemptive work, his saving ministry. Thank you for the abiding presence of God in the person of the Holy Spirit who gave us new hearts and minds, and is even now working in us and through us, sanctifying us, moving us along, opening the scriptures to us that we might comprehend the things that you've written for our edification and learning correction and instruction. 
Lord, I commit this church to your tender care and ministry and pray that you would walk with us and move us to be good and godly people, unified in every good word and work, to the saving of souls and for the glory of Christ Jesus who loved us first. We pray these things in his name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Friends, we have a closing song, and then our dear brother Girish will come and give us our benediction. God bless you all. Thank you so much.